Do you know what, Susie? No. Nope. I um, <laughs> no. Right now, I actually wouldn't mind an Android phone. What? Yeah. What, Mr. Apple fanboy? Well, the truth Why? is, actually, in the years sort of post gadget show, I uh, actually got full Android-y. You'd no, be surprised. No, actually, I do know. remember you saying that. Yeah, yeah like I did. widgets, all that stuff. All that malarkey. Yeah. Although now I am, I'm fully Appled up at, at the moment. But there was a new feature that's come out uh, as a result of the uh, the new Android 14, um, and it's it's called they're called audio emojis. Oh. And they're great. And then they're a bit like text emojis. You know, you send someone a love heart or an aubergine. Well, I hope uh, you don't do that. Or a poo. And <laughs> but I know you but do. Now you can do it with audio. Would you like me to demonstrate Not it? Not really. Because I like it so much. I would almost like to buy myself an Android phone. I've borrowed one. If it rings, it'll be me. Right, okay. I'm answering. I don't know what to expect here. Hang on. Hello? Hi, who's that? <laughs> Sorry, that was... Uh, what joke. number? All right. <laughs> and just in case you're not getting this you, you can do this during a phone call so you can add anything you can have applause during, thank you very much ladies and gentlemen thank you no no come on thank you do another one. Oh, beautiful I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a good joke there you go if I told you a really awful joke yeah that goes through my head a lot when we're doing our podcast thank you I do like this though I think it's um Often, I should tell you, let's disconnect the call, yeah. because otherwise it's like having 19 Jasons, which, frankly, nobody wants. Um, yeah, it's, it, I like it. It's a genuinely original idea, and that's not a thing that we often get. It feels like it's... I mean, obviously, it's a bit retro, but it's... I don't know. It's a bit slapstick, isn't it? It's not my thing. All right. You've not impressed me at bit all. Of, bit of a downer, isn't it? <laughs> bit of a buzzkill. But I just find it a little bit sort of slapstick. I think it's a bit... <laughs> You just did it! Yes, you don't need it, then you do you? You just did it. All right, roll the titles. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Gadget Show podcast. Uh, if you're completely new uh, to all this, she's Jason Bradbury and I'm Susie Perry. Well... That suits me just fine because you'll have to wear the leather cat suit then. Yay! Hey. Actually, that suits me fine too. Oh no. Yeah, although I might need uh, a bit of lube. Right. To pull it on. Okay, uh, that's where we're going to leave the avenue of ad lube, <laughs> ad lube um, <laughs> to the show then. Uh, we're both going to love it this week because um, our guest brings together the worlds that we both inhabit outside of the gadget that's show. True. That's motor racing and gaming. Uh, isn't that madly yeah. congruent? Uh, do you remember when we, uh, we raced? Well, I raced, I was on a computer racing simulator. I think I was in a Porsche and I was trackside at Silverstone. Uh, and I was racing the real Johnny Herbert, oh. who was on a, in, in a proper racing car on the actual track, and we were we were head to head, the virtual versus the real world. Yeah, the, the fact that you bring it up does that mean that you won? Johnny, Johnny, no, no, yes, I can see by I, the response. you can see by the way I'm going like this. I beat you, my man. <laughs> Oh, that's unbelievable. A few seconds, but it's a few seconds that will remain golden for the rest of my life. I think I probably did, Susie. Yeah. Right. I probably, uh, you know, like, uh, celebbed the rules so that it would end up with me winning. Poor Johnny. <laughs> yeah, Poor lovely Johnny. He didn't know Johnny. why I hit him. <laughs> well, you know, you don't normally. Um, right, moving on again. Yes. Um, got a lovely message here from Sharice Shade. Oh, great. Oh, my God, Sharice. Do you remember Sharice? She was basically our security at the Gadget Show. Oh, my life. God. Oh Trevor. my God! I do at the NEC and the NEC in Birmingham, the Gadget Show Live Security Lady. Yeah, that's she, nuts. She looked after us. She was there. anyway. What did she say? She said, "I spent hours with Susie and Jace over the years at the Gadget Show oh. Live. It was always an epic time. Discovered noise cancelling headphones with Susie. See, I've always been obsessed with this. You have, uh, actually. And, and P.S. Loving these podcasts. I'm genuinely touched. I think um, I'm not saying that you just touched me. Um, well, I've never touched you. No. No, I live Never in hope. Will. But um, sh uh, no, genuinely, that's the loveliest thing ever. You're all right. I'm not coming over that side <laughs> of the table. You're all right. Anyway, Sharice, thank you very much. We loved hanging out with you and you looked after us. So thank you very much. And Sharice, you mentioned noise cancelling headphones there, um, which brings me very neatly to start this podcast. So I'd like to start it. Susie Perry, what have you been playing with this week? I've been playing with these. Oh, Nice the, case. These are the Bose Ultra Open Earbuds. I'm holding up a beautiful case that charges some open earbuds. Now, before, before I get to these, I just want to do a little bit of a potted history of 
noise cancellation, really. Brilliant. Can I just go and get a coffee while you do that? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Would you get me one as well? And I'll just talk to myself. <laughs> well, as you know, you know, you've got active noise cancellation and passive noise cancellation. So passive, basically ear defenders. Active gives you the magic of being able to filter out what you don't want to listen to. Um, and I think it's fair to say that Bose have led the way. They've spearheaded the way here. And we're going back to um, go back to the 1950s where the technology started for pilots because obviously there's a lot of noise and they needed to be able to hear people talking to them and oh, they needed wow. yeah. So that's that's where the noise um, cancellation came from. Bose were very much involved in that. And that's where, in 2000, they marketed their quiet comfort range, which, obviously, when we started the gadget show, we used to use those all the time, mm. didn't we, really? Well, I had a pair. Yeah, yeah. I and, had a pair. And these are their quiet comfort earbuds. So which... you're holding up the, the black case of the quiet comfort Bose, which I think both of us have owned at one yeah. stage or other. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm not a fan of sticking things in my ears. Right, because I think it's because I'm a live broadcaster and I have to do it all the time. I hate it and it hurts my ears. And I have not found any in ear buds that I've been able to wear for long periods of time uh, that have been very comfortable. So when I was offered these, the latest um, foray from Bose, which don't go into your ear canal, I was quite interested and intrigued but also slightly confused because I do like to block the world out. <laughs> and like, if I'm sitting on a plane, I like to block everybody out. I'm not interested in anybody talking to me. I'm quite antisocial. But there's a lot of reasons to, to mm. be interested in these. So can, can I just say, what you've, you've really touched on something. So I've got the AirPod Pro yeah. uh, from Apple. I'm holding them up right now, a little white case. And I am guilty of wearing these too much. And I'm being serious. These have caused a couple of arguments mm. in our house. Because they alienate everybody they else. They do, and my wife in particular says, you've always got your ear pods mm. in. Or, and, and actually, to be fair to her, she's, she's right, because they're so comfortable. I often don't even know I've got them in. And you get drawn into content, like the Gadget Show podcast, for example. Uh, no, but in all seriousness, it can be quite alienating to other people. And that's why Bose have brought out these. Let me can pass I just them say, to you. I just want to describe for yeah, our do. people that are they, listening. They, and they not look watching. actually, and they're supposed to look like a piece of jewellery. I was just about to say they look like an elegant, uh, quite large form pair of earrings. There's, there's a metallic uh, case around the outside, but they're actually quite, well, they're quite sort of flexible, mm. quite almost like they rubbery, are the silicon, they? Yeah, they're silicon, yeah. Silicon, right. So they, that's why they sit very, and they're really light. Can I put them on? Is that Absolutely, okay? Absolutely, yeah. But you want to basically have the button behind your ear because that's what you press to take a phone call or to um, skip a track or whatever. The music's on straight away. I've got an old... Uh, that's not in your ear, so you just... just. It's because you've got big Dumbo flappy ears. Oh, thanks. <laughs> So it sits really comfortably outside of the ear canal, looking like a piece of jewellery. And it's not bone conduction, it's air conducting. So it's basically a little speaker that's directing the sound into your ear. The idea is to be able to listen to your music, your podcasts, whatever you want to listen to, but also to be able to be aware of what's going on around you. So th there's an obvious sa safety angle here. Now, what I found, I tested it on a beach in Mallorca, um, and I just sort of thought, well, this will be quite good because... There's I, a lot I of want, ambient sound, isn't I want to hear the, the sea, I want to hear the... <coughs> of people having a nice time, and yeah. I want to listen to my music. So I, I, I tried that. There's obviously an app, and you, change, you, know, you can change modes and all that kind of stuff. And it was lovely. It was like just really sort of listening with a ghetto blaster next to you, but being Can able I to hear all now? the noises. Can I just say, you've just exactly described what I'm experiencing. What you probably don't know, because I'm guessing there's not a lot of bleed through that you can hear. It's a tiny bit, and you're always going to get that well, if I, something's I, not shoved in your ear. Like, like, we're, like we've got a ghetto blaster, yeah. you know, two feet away. I'm listening to the radio, um, and yet... I heard every single word you just yeah. said, and that would definitely not be the case on the AirPod Pros. Uh, it, so I, I really like this. See, I, I really like this. I've got to be honest. I, I like the balance. Yeah, I didn't know kind of or understand what it was for and whether I would like it. I thought I really wouldn't like it, but I wore those damn things all day and they were so comfortable. At one point, I was heading towards the sea to go for a swim. I thought, oh my God, I've still got these oh, in. Yeah, that can be an issue. I do that when I'm, when I'm washing my hair. So the great thing about these is they're so comfortable, you can wear them all day. So that's why they're light, they're really comfortable and they look like jewellery, yeah. right? And they've got seven and a half hours of battery time unless you're using immersive, which you'll, you know, reduce and drain the, the immersive battery audio a little mode. bit. Yeah, which you don't, I don't think you need. That's not is what that they're like for. Is that like the spatial audio on the AirPod Pros? 
Yeah. Similar idea. So yeah. you, you get a sense of the origin of the music in the, in the positioning sense. So I move to the left, it stays to my right sort of thing. Yeah, now that's interesting. But four and a half hours is okay. Seven and a half hours is, is excellent. And I'm currently listening to Jamiroquai. Mm. I'm aware of what track it is. I could even sing along to it. Like, that's how clear it is. Yeah. This is, um, these are really good. It's a new direction. I like them. So, you know, other companies have kind of played around with this. But I, I just genuinely think with these that they... Well, I just found them to be really comfortable. Yeah. And I was a bit worried about, like, if you listen to a song with bass, is it going to be a bit light, you know? And you never, I don't think, ever going to get that real bassy sound if you don't cover your whole ear. But it's pretty good. I think you'll agree. I, I absolutely agree. I was just fiddling with the button, which is a very tactile, very... Right. Um, and that's obviously... Seductive experience. Yep, so you with the, with the button on the back, that's where you take a phone call, you skip a track, you switch things, you know, switch off. Have you off got multiple and, presses to do different actions? Yeah, 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 you have. And I'll just go through a couple of the modes on the app and and you'll see how subtle those are. So let's put it in um, immersion. Okay, the effect is not as uh, profound as the AirPod Pros. I would have a sense that uh, this Jamiroquai track was coming from one place. So I'm pointing at you now, Susie. If I move my head to the left, your audio would go to the... My music would go to the right. Does that make sense? So it's almost like you're in the audience. And if you move around the auditorium, the sound still comes at you from the stage. That's what the spatial audio effect is in the AirPod Pros. This, I'm guessing, what do they call it? Immersive audio on the Bose that I'm wearing doesn't sound feel quite as concrete. Okay, in interesting. I'm just going to do you um, relax mode. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm guessing Jamiroquai's upbeat dance track is not the best no, example. No, probably not. Although we've moved to a little Hammond organ. Oh, yeah, very jazzy. I suppose naturally these will get compared to AirPods because they're the market leader. But effectively, they're not doing the same job. That's not what what they're launching here. No. It's to let the outside in. And, and to be able to wear them all day. To, because be, to be able to wear them all day, I'm, whatever I'm you're that. doing. Because I did... They're so comfortable. I did Pilates, yoga, uh, did a little workout you're Wearing in them. these? Yep, wearing really? them. Yep. And they don't move. They just sit there. And as you said, you almost went into the ocean with them on. And I can... I can I, just wearing them for a short period of time, I can really, I really get that. And that's how comfortable they are. There is a sense that there is a, there is a, a sort of 10% lack of impact. Yeah. Which I, you're always going to get, yeah, I'm used unless to. you block your but ears. But then I often get an update on my iPhone telling me that I've been listening for too long at too high a volume. It's part of the health that's function an, that's of the That's actually iPhone. another good point. Yeah. I mean, they're a little bit pricey, as you kind of, I suppose, would expect with Bose. They, what sort of money are they? Yeah, they're, they're towards £300. Wow. But it'll be interesting to see, you know, whether they really take off, whether, whether people kind of buy into this. Um, what I would say is you probably need two. You probably need the... Up you know, noise cancellation to for, block for out for your flights because yeah. you don't want anyone talking to you on a flight because everybody gets on your nerves. Or is that just me? I don't know. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry about that. Yeah. And then, and then some, you know, you, and these then you can wear all day, every day. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, You're not getting them back. Uh, that's okay. See, I thought you wouldn't like them. No, I like now them. No, you a want lot. them, don't you? Mm, I do. Yeah, but I do want them back. All right. Our guest this week is Lee Mather, who's the Senior Creative Director of Codemasters in Birmingham. It is lovely to have you here. Thank you so much. I'm desperate to talk to you about the Formula One game. Um, maybe we can kind of kick off with that, actually. F124, it's about to come out. Yeah, yeah, at the end and, of this month. And it's month. your baby, isn't it? It is. It's been my baby for quite a while, and it's on those things that, like, I've... I've always loved Formula One, so being able to work on the Formula One game is amazing. But this time of year is the best time of year for me because, yeah, we're reaching the, the point where we finally get to show people what we've been doing this year, what the team have been working on, and, and get that feedback from the, the players. And how does, how does it work? How does the process work of creating a game like that? So it could, because it's an annual franchise, we, we have a, a really significant team that we split into two parts. So we've always got one team working on the, the current game, so the 24 title, and then we've got a smaller team who are working ahead on what we're going to be doing next. Um, we've got a, a fairly significant roadmap for the sort of features that we want to bring in the next few years as well. Can I ask you about that roadmap? An interesting use of the word road. Um, I, I'm intrigued to know how you creatively, what, how you refresh it. Because, I mean, I've been, in, I, look, I've been into your games, by, by which I mean Codemasters, because you're EA, aren't you? But you were, you still are Codemasters. Um, am I right? Did the first Codemasters game come out in, was it the Grand Prix Sim 1987? 
Yeah, I mean, when I was a small child, Codemasters were, were around creating games on Spectrum and Commodore 64. And yeah, they did They did a, an F1 title all there, the way brother. back then. I was there. We were we also gonna... small children then as well. Uh, well, 87, I would have been, what, 18 maybe? Like Ever since then... You know, doing this thing, not, not always year on year, but now year on year, being creative, thinking how to engage you know, the, the gaming uh, consumers into buying a brand new upgrade on a 12 monthly basis, that's quite challenging. So first of all, what new things can we expect from F124 mm -hmm. and, and how do you plan that roadmap? Yeah, so new in 24, the driver career. So we've got an entirely new driver career. It's like the absolute core of the game. It's a real sort of love letter to the fans. It's that um, authenticity and the sort of the That's representation of the sport. a good marketing line, isn't it? Yeah. Love it's, letter to the fans. It's, it's something we don't do very often, the, the driver career. So, so basically, when, when we did the first title in 2010, the, the career part of it was one of the most popular and successful parts of the game because it represents the sport. And then in 2016, we did a new version of the driver career. And then this is the, the biggest refresh we've done. So we don't do that very often, but it is the absolute core of the game. It's the opportunity to play as a Formula One driver, an F2 driver, one of the icons, so a classic driver, and, and immerse yourself in the world of Formula One. One of the 20, you call it, don't you? Yes. So the career path, so what exactly does that mean? In the game, the context is you can go in as a Formula One driver and you'll start your career in the position that that Formula One driver is in in the real sport. You can go in as a Formula Two driver, so you come through the ranks of Formula Two into Formula right. One. Or you can go in as yourself, as an avatar, where you would start out either in Formula 2 or in Formula 1. And you can choose to go in, obviously, with one of the top teams and your goals and targets will be win races, win championships. Or you can go in at one of the, the sort of further teams further back on the grid and your goals then will be develop the car, develop the team and work your way up to a winning position. Can I just ask another question? Yeah, right. She's Sorry, on board, no, you've sold it. To, no. She's getting it on her laptop. No, it's just this. It's just because the whole model of Formula One has changed in the last few years um, since Liberty came in. And, and we all know, you know, it's grown so much, particularly in the United States. Have you had a knock on of that as well? Have you noticed any difference? Significantly, yes. Yeah. So when we first started working on Formula One, the market was very different. The audience was very different. Obviously, Drive to Survive made a massive difference as well, especially in North America. We've got a very different audience now, but they're also coming in through different routes. So if you look at when Liberty took over, they added the ability for the drivers to suddenly have more visibility on socials. So now you get great socials. A lot of the drivers have got their own YouTube channels. It's really like an opportunity for people to be closer to the drivers. I wanted yeah. to ask you about that because mm. I was on the old uh, YouTube um, and I saw Lando Norris. Uh, from the McLaren team, and and I don't know if it was his channel or, or someone had just, you know, got him on board, but he was playing the new F124, and he definitely got his seal of approval. It was a great video. I really encourage anyone mm -hmm. to watch that, actually. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so he's a big figure on social media, isn't he? I think you, you don't you, you have a... Isn't he one of your kind of... Well, uh, Crowd. I've interviewed Lando a few times because he's a big MotoGP fan. Right, he's, yeah. he's always been obsessed with Valentino Rossi. He's like worn all the merch, you really? know, the full, absolute full kit. You know, <laughs> he's, he's been obsessed, but he's brilliant now. He's you know obviously won a race, and but he's got a great sense of humour, and obviously he's, he's British, so you know it's fantastic for us, isn't it? Yeah, Lando's brilliant. He he's done the Lando's plays a few times now, where he's played our games, and he's obviously got his own brand out there with Quantum and his own channel. So you know, a lot of the drivers have seen that as a great opportunity as well, like Max Verstappen who we work really closely with he does his red line which is the the esports team that he you know races with yeah. as part of so the younger drivers have got a much better view of, of gaming mm. as well so that connection that we get between gaming and the sport is is so valuable obviously i want to ask you about esports we, we actually had an episode on this show recently where we talked about esports and it's very very close to my heart when my son is in that whole world what's going on with the esports thing and how does that affect you developing a new title like f124 yeah, so we build a really thorough online multiplayer mode in the game, and obviously that lends itself well to esports. So we did our first official F1 esports in 2017, and we did that with Formula One officially. We did it in um, Abu Dhabi. We did the finals there. It was amazing. We were in a garage, and we've done it every year since. Uh, we even did it remotely during, during lockdowns, and then this year it's just concluded the official F1 Sim Racing Championship. And right. uh, Freddie Rasmussen run this year, won this year. He's been part of the championship for many years. It's his first win for the Red Bull team. That's something we talked about on the Gadget Show back in the day about how... You know, how could a sim make you... Could it? Could, it was, could you be able to drive a real car? It was fantasy then, Suze. I know, it was fantasy then. It's incredible. I mean, it's important to make this point, isn't it? Because it's it's kind of... 
expected now, isn't it? Because there's even a movie, isn't there, about Gran Turismo and, and the, the journey of one yeah. youngster yeah. to the real world of, 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 of motor racing. Um, but you're right, back in the gadget show days, that was a kind of novel idea, wasn't yeah. it? Let's and now test it, this now scenario. Now it's real, now yeah. it's happening. F124 then, where does it sit in terms of... So the professional teams that have these incredible simulators, which the drivers tend to hate, but the loads of data they can pull from. And also, if there's a new track that they haven't been able to drive, then, you know, it's a, it's a good way in for them to learn the track. Where does it sit in terms of simulator and the, and the game? Is it a simulator? Is it a game? How closely do they correspond? Yes, yeah, so something that we've always set out to do is achieve a, a representation of driving a Formula One car. Obviously, it's got to be driven on a controller. It's also got to be driven on a wheel and pedal. So you've yeah. got to take that into account. But when you consider that a, a Formula One driver in a Formula One sim is designed to give feedback and validate data when setting up a car, what we're trying to do is replicate the driving experience so players get to feel like they're a Formula One driver. So we work very closely with the teams to get the data and share the data with the teams to ensure that our cars achieve their lap times in the same way as a Formula One car. So we want players to be able to feel like they're a Formula One driver. So we simulate all of the elements and, and 24 this year, one of the biggest updates is actually in the physics. And we've changed the way that we model the suspension. So we've got what's termed suspension kinematics. So the geometry changes and the contact patch of the tire changes when it touches the track surface. And that allows for things like the anti-dive and the anti-squat. So all of the things that Formula One teams model into their cars to ensure that the aero is consistent and a stable platform, we build that into the model. That's well, that, it, no, it's amazing because it is effectively all down to the tyre and the contact patch, like you said. I mean, everything is about that contact patch, isn't it? The whole of the car or bike or whatever is affected by, by what's coming from that tyre and, well, and the I'm, feeling they're getting from that, that. That's what Lando Norris in that video I watched, that's what he was talking about. And he was adjusting all the downforce and stuff. Yeah. But no, I, I, I'm fascinated by this. I can tell you a little story that I, when I first met my wife, she obviously um, she came back to eventually to my flat and she came in. And I think she was quite horrified by what I'd assembled in the front room, in the lounge, because as a bachelor, it never occurred to me that it was weird. And I had this, um, it's not like a dominatrix type thing. Oh, no, I don't know it? where you're going with it. Yeah, <laughs> we're worried. And I had the fully hydraulic flight simulator rig, oh. which I'd, um, I'd cobbled together. And I had multiple computers and multiple monitors, because back then, to have multiple screens for that wraparound effect and the multifunction displays and things, on, on it would have been Microsoft Flight Simulator or X-Plane. You actually had to have separate computers for each monitor and then a bit of uh, an Ethernet cable and some software. Are you going back to the late 90s, are you? It would have been probably 99, 2000 mm. maybe. I, even then, I understood the, the way that it was going and how technical and scientific it was. But uh, the level it's at now is absolutely extraordinary. And the money that people are spending, what sort of money for one of those you know, hydraulic steering wheels and, and a seat to go with it? What sort of money are we looking at? So, I mean, that's an area that's really accelerated in recent years. We, when we first started, we didn't see a huge amount of wheel users, but now it's, it's a lot, lot more. And I think that's because the range is so expanded. Fanatec came into the market Fanatec, and really, yeah. they really kicked things up where previously it was either sort of bungee cord wheels or geared wheels, belt driven wheels. And they came out with a consumer level direct drive wheel, which you could buy for around a thousand pounds. You know, in pre <laughs> previous, previously you were in for four or five thousand pounds if you wanted a direct drive wheel. Now all of the wheel manufacturers are in that space. And then there's the likes of Play Seat and Next Level Racing and, and multiple others that create full race rigs as well. You can get ones that are so convenient you can fold them up when you bring your girlfriend back at the weekend and you that don't want to look better, like you've got I think you put her off a bit, Sue. Yeah, I, I hide She's mine under the She's still with you, stairs. mate. Yeah. So I'll hide mine, mine under the stairs. So it folds up and it hides under the stairs nice. when I've got guests coming around so I yeah. don't look too dodgy. But um, yeah, but then you can get full rigs that are full motion as well. And, and there's a, I think it's the F1, there's an authentic range that goes with like £100,000. You know, they're, they're insane. They're absolutely incredible. And it's a, a partially cut up chassis of a Formula One car. <laughs> You know, wow. and it's, it's just there's something oh, incredible but, you know, there, things there is there. incredible obsession out there isn't there um when you're developing the game or, or, or do you get or who does anyone get the physical experience of being in a formula one car because i know they're fiercely defensive of letting anybody in those cars so have you ever have you ever sat in a car have you ever you know been in a formula one car so i've never been in a formula one car i've driven one of the team simulators which is again really rare they don't so is generally... that the closest you get to to experiencing it then? to being in a real formula one car yes I, i've been lucky enough to drive other formulas other single yeah. seater formulas and i've been a passenger in a formula 3000 car at donington which was incredible um, and i've got to drive sort of formula 3000 cars formula four cars but then they're, they're just light years away from what a Formula mm. One car can do. How close was that simulator, that official team simulator, to what you're, you're offering customers in this year's game? 
So it was it was really close, to be fair. So I jumped in. I think it was it was a good few years ago, and it was Korea race weekend. And I was able to jump in, and the, they put you in headphones, they put you in a helmet, they put you in a race suit. They didn't attach the cords because they have cords to allow the driver to work their neck while they're in the simulator. Um, I didn't have those because they said my poor little neck wouldn't cope. So uh, I jumped in. I did Korea. They said, leave it in start mode. It was a switch on the wheel. You don't need all the power. I did a lap, and they said, actually, you're doing okay. Give yourself full power. And, and, and it was so relatable. I was instantly able to jump into a Formula One simulator and relate what I'd learned in the game. I mean, if it was up to me, based on my own experience of, of watching F1 with my dad, which I used to love in the, in the, in the 80s. I know you can't drive the John Player special, you know, um, but there are some historic drivers, if I'm not mistaken, in the new title. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. It's something that with the new driver career as well, it's interesting to see that you'll be able to have the, the icons in there. So you could pair Max Verstappen with Michael Schumacher or Ayrton Senna. Nigel or, Mansell. Or I was just going to say, or our Nigel. You yes. could have our Nigel. Yeah, absolutely. So you can. And we've got Nigel from 92 as well. So it's, it's in his prime with the moustache. And uh, yeah, it's brilliant realisation of the character. I think, I think what's interesting about this is it, it, it's quite an emotional sport. Like I think, you know, w your relationship with this, like I'm just talking about my dad and being able to, exp you know, connect to the sport through that kind of relationship. You know, that, and that's what you, that's what, you've got quite a lot of responsibility in your hands, haven't you really? It, it's funny you say that because the audience originally, a lot of people came to Formula One through connections with their family, with their parents, yeah. with friends. Um, and now modern F1, it, it's also that, but also it's people coming in through Drive to Survive and through the driver's socials and the drivers being the characters themselves. I mean, you mentioned how much uh, Lando loves Valentino Rossi. Now he's transcended the sport of MotoGP because everybody knows who Valentino Rossi is and it's becoming that way with Formula One drivers. Everybody knows who Lewis Hamilton is. Everybody knows who Max Verstappen is. Lando's a real character. Charles Leclerc's really famous. George Russell, you know, these mm. people have... They've come into the public consciousness now. They're not just drivers in a, a sport that somebody's maybe not interested in. They're celebrities and they're, they're that, famous and they're all right. That was the 80s, wasn't it? It's, yeah, because they had... And the they, 70s. They were allowed to bring their characters out then and then the whole sponsorship thing came in and it flattened everything. And, and Bernie, to a certain degree as well, I think, you know, did flatten that. Um, and, and now my favourite driver for personality and, and taking the mick out of himself is Valtteri Bottas. He's done some fantastic things online. I mean, he, he's wonderful and he's great for the sport and, and and that's what it needs you know it needs those characters because they they were squashed for a long time yeah. can I ask you about the root of the data I don't want to be boring but I'm just interested in in the fact that you can't go out there and drive the Formula One car but the amount of data that's harvested that goes into their simulator can you explain where you get your data from to make it so realistic so we've got a, a guy on the handling team who's an engineer his entire career has always been in mechanical engineering so he takes the rule set and builds a Formula One car to the rules as the real teams do. <laughs> and, and then he will then look at all of the data that's publicly available on Formula One cars and the lap times they produce and how they produce them. And he'll build a model that's as close as we can get. We then share it with the teams, the certain teams who we, we work really, really closely with. They will play the game. And our game outputs a lot of data through UDP and you can log that data. And they will log that data and they'll compare it to a trace from the real car at that circuit from the previous year or the current year, depending on when, it, when the race took place. And they will point us in the right direction. So they'll you know, say, well, maybe your braking distances are a little bit long or your cornering speeds are too high. They wouldn't be generating that kind of downforce through there. And that's what allows us to, to balance it against the real cars. And are you, getting, are you actually getting feedback from real Formula One drivers as well? Drivers and engineers, yes. That's, that's amazing, nice. isn't it? And just flying the Midlands flag for a minute, because Codemasters is based in the Midlands, isn't it? So, you know, we're, we're neighbours. We're practically neighbours. Yeah, definitely. The the, uh, the head office was in Warwickshire, still in Warwickshire, and the F1 studio is predominantly based out of the centre of Birmingham, and we've been here since mid-90s. I so love it's, it. It's kept its DNA then, hasn't yeah. it, really? It, even though it's under the, the umbrella of EA Sports, Codemasters is, is the racing fraternity, isn't it? It is. I mean, when we were... Before we were a part of EA, one of the things that we did was we doubled down on racing. That was the big thing. You know, we knew that Codemasters were known for their racing titles and that's what we were best at. And that's during the era of obviously Colin McRae Rally. And, and I was going to say, yeah. you, you fly, you're still flying the flag, but yet you've come a long way from BMX Simulator yeah. in 1986, uh, Tocker. Um, I remember Colin McRae and, of course, the awesome Micro Machines. That's what Codemasters will always be for me. That and the Darling Brothers... Um, you know, that, that part of gaming is, is solid gold. You know, it's extraordinary to think, you're, A, you're still going and you're still absolutely smashing it. 
Yeah. Codemasters are one of the originals. They were absolute originators in the industry. They, they did some groundbreaking things. Micro Machines was incredible. And to still be around today and, and still have the, the same studio. I mean, if you, if you go to the, the, the head office in Warwickshire, it used to be a farmhouse. It's now a huge campus, which caters to people with a gym and you know, football pitch. You know, it's, it's grown, but it's still, still the same need. DNA. The Gadget Show podcast need. is very, very similar. Yeah, we need that. To, yeah, we've got well, a gym, haven't we? And, uh, well, I say that. We've got a... Nothing there's a, there's empty, a dumbbell in the corner. An empty warehouse. Yeah. Can I just ask, on a day-to-day -day basis, what is your role then? My role at the moment is very much looking forward to what the, the next thing is that we're going to be doing. So I have a, a close connection to what the current development team's doing on both years. Um, I obviously oversee the design teams, so what the designs are, what they're producing there, what the features are going to be, why they're going to be exciting, why players are going to find them fun, why they're going to be engaging. Um, and then, yeah, very much like, what are we doing next? I was going to say, how far ahead do you have to look? We generally sort of look in vaguely five years, but more fixed sort of three to four. Gosh. So hover cars for the next one then, yeah? If that's what arrives in the sport, then, <laughs> uh, then we'll be moving towards hover cars. <laughs> obviously the gaming industry is massive you know you hear loads of kids don't you wanting to get into that industry so what what kind of roles are there available and what would your advice be on anybody that would want to come in yeah i mean that's changed significantly from when i started out in qa back in the early 90s um but now there's so many like real official courses that you can take to get into the industry that focus on all of the different disciplines and i mean keeping it regional both staffordshire and coventry have got brilliant programs in game design and, and multiple other disciplines as well but yeah, there's so many different roles that you can come into the industry with. A strong one is always to come in in QA because you learn so much working in the quality control department. You, you touch so many other areas of the business and you get to really understand how a game's developed. Obviously, we have design. We have technical design that do things like they build the tracks, uh, the, the AI lines for the cars in our game. We have the teams who actually build the circuits, build the cars. So we have art resource. We have people who obviously program the game. We have physics coders. We have AI coders. We have people who do the visual effects. We have people who do the audio. You know, and then obviously there's the entire supporting cast of all of the people who bring the game to market and promote it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge, huge industry. Wow. Well, the game's out now. So, you know, best of luck with it. Thank you so much for your time. It's been really fascinating, hasn't it? It's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, thanks, Lee. I Incredible. want to go and play it. Uh, thank I'm you. super inspired to play it. I've got an interesting one for you, Susie. Yeah, go on. Okay, it's a little bit niche. I like niche. Okay, all right. Uh, I'm not so sure about this one myself, but uh, it's definitely a novel idea. Can okay. you see, can, maybe you could describe what I've got to well, my uh, left. Well, next to Jason is what looks like a sort of suitcase, briefcase, a yeah. briefcase. Yeah. And it's um, vanilla, beige, in colour. Strange colour. Yeah. It, it looks like a med medical device might be does, there. It does, actually, but it looks pretty serious. Like, it's got some serious, it's heavy. It's quite heavy. It's quite heavy, yeah. It's quite strong, that case. I thought you were going to say, I look quite strong. Uh, what's in your case, Jace? It's called the LG Stand By Me Go. And that go refers to the fact, I'm trying to do this while opening it, that you can take this with you anywhere. What is it? Oh, it's a portable it's screen. It's a portable screen that can be configured in all kinds of different positions, like, like this, the more traditional upright horizontal format. You can go vertical with it. I'm trying not to break the thing by holding it on my knee. There we go. It's hard with one hand. Um, and all, interestingly, you can also spin it around uh, yeah. as it came in the box. Did you notice it started up as well when I opened the case? That's quite nice. It's a touch screen, so you can spin around on there. Um, you can play board games on it as well, which is quite interesting. It comes with a chess game, and I'm guessing with the LG operating system, there are other games available, or you could indeed play possibly browser-based games, although I've never tried it. It's just, it's, an, it's a novel idea. I'm, I'm interested to know, though, you know, what its user case is? Well, I, I imagine it's for friends and family on the go. So portable screen, so you can watch movies. Yeah. What, does it sound good? It sounds really, really good. In fact, I'll try and bring up the Because uh, I can YouTube. see the, I can see the picture's crisp. Yeah. It's good. So if there's a group of you watching a movie, you could do that. If you were outside having a barbecue or a party or something like that and you wanted to share some content, that's the way to do it, isn't it? Well, the, uh, the speaker they've included in the lid of the box is the Dolby Vision Atmos speaker. So that's obviously a, a, a well-renowned platform. that You don't get the Dolby badge without having some au you know, audio credentials. Mm. Is it like if, imagine if you went camping or on holiday because you stick that in the car in your camper van. Because it's a, essentially like a massive tablet. It is. I mean, the thing is, 
So I've got a, uh, a small California, the, 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 the little camper van from VW, right? And I'd love to have a large format screen, but there's no way I could have one permanently installed. Mm -hmm. But this, with this rugged case, with its kind of moulded interior that it's protects like it's the case. It's military grade. Yeah, as long as you don't you know, m mind scratching the outside of the case too much, look, it turns off automatically. I could clip that up, slide it under the seat quite easily or in the back of the boot. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't have to use it all the time, but the times I used it would be really memorable. And it's got a three hour battery in it. That's another big feature. So you can plug it into the mains, but you can also use it for three hours, which is quite a long playtime. I can imagine sitting under the stars, watching a movie around the campfire. It's, it's a, it's a really okay. portable entertainment system. And it's, look, it's different. It's not for everyone. It's, I, not, it's not so cheap. It's, it's relatively expensive. You know, you won't get much change out of 1,300 quid. But I think for those people that, that see the potential for this, it's quite an, an interesting one. Maybe not so niche after all. Thank you. And with that, I rest my case. Oh! <laughs> you know what time it is now? What time is it? Time to go. Oh, no, no the home it. time. That's it for another podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, well, I, it, did were you? you speaking to me? Because I did enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you did. But I also hope that you at home enjoyed it. And so thank you so much uh, for all of your lovely comments and, and interaction with the shows so far. It's been lovely, isn't it, hearing from everyone? Oh, I know what I would like to know. Where are you listening or watching the podcast? Maybe you can message us and let us know. Yeah, how, what proportion of you listen and what proportion of you watch the podcast? Because, of course, we, we produce this in two versions. But with that in mind, can I ask those of you that have had a really good time to maybe pop across to our our Patreon page. Um, there are loads of ways that you can help us because we want to try and keep this adventure going and Patreon is one of the ways that you can really lend a hand and uh, your support is hugely appreciated. Check out the Patreon page and the links on the screen or below this uh, pod right now. Join the gang. Thank yeah, you. Join the gang and we'll see you next time. See you next time. The Gadget Show podcast with Jason and Susie was presented by Jason Bradbury and Susie Perry off the telly. It was produced by Ewan Keel and Tom Clint and is a North One production.